Well, hello, everybody. My name is Ted Benford, and the talk tonight is on the uh, college recruiting process. Uh, this is really an exploration of uh, uh, an overview, sort of a, um, a review and a um, outline for what uh, the college recruiting process is all about. Um, <clears throat> I'm about to share a slides. I think I'm going to do a fair amount of talking with some slides and I'll share with you how to um, submit any questions and, and uh, we'll try to get through that as quick as we can. It's a pretty full presentation, so I'm going to do a fair amount of talking, uh, sharing my screen and uh, look forward to an interaction at the end, which would be pretty brief. Um, and I'll give you some more direction on how we're going to go from there. Um, so just to begin here, um, the college recruiting process is um, quite a quite a quite a challenge for people who haven't been familiar with it or aren't or are going through this for the first time. And um, what I want to do with this presentation is really just share the experience of, of recruiting from the perspective of a collegiate rowing coach. Uh, I've, I've rowed and coached for over 25 years. Um, we'll do a little bit of getting inside baseball, but um, really this is an exploration or an overview and a way to get you thinking about some questions or some of the items within the process of recruiting. For athletes on the call, um, they might find some tidbits or some information to give you confidence to be yourself to be authentic and aware of what your audience is looking for um, compared to quote unquote, all those other recruits out there. Um, I think for parents, it's to understand some of the big buckets of process and resources that, that you may be able to avail yourself of. Um, and then for me, it's really to share a little bit about my experience, but really to help CRI and our community support each other and uh, share what I can to be a, a resource for people. Um, so uh, this is, um, a little bit of uh, lessons learned and knowledge gained, um, and uh, really just sort of treat this discussion as uh, sort of recruiting 101. Um, just so you know, there will be other engagements and other programs for us to provide you with more detail about specific facets of the process. Um, last year, we had a panel discussion with uh, coaches from Northeastern, Harvard, Williams, and Boston College Crew Club sort of the division one perspective, men and women, and the division three and the, and the club perspective. Uh, we're gonna try to put that panel discussion again. Uh, we've also had interest from other people to do uh, uh, some presentations on some of the facets of, uh, of, um, of uh, the college recruiting process. So hopefully this will be the start of a, a number of different opportunities for you to get some information. My coaching background, um, well, like I said, I've been uh, a, a career coach for over 25 years as a head coach and primary recruiter for uh, a number of different programs. Um, I'll say that my primary sense of satisfaction from coaching was really improving the performance of the programs that I coached. And the first tenet in, the, in, in my goals in terms of coaching was to uh, try to find the right student athletes for the, for the programs that I served. Um, in the last three positions that I held in coaching, the head coach at MIT, head coach at Tufts, and the associate head coach in charge of recruiting at Northeastern, um, the programs really underwent considerable culture change uh, through um, uh, having different recruited athletes at the program and um, really thinking about um, where those programs were in terms of their future. They were all sort of going through some changes. Tufts was building a new boathouse and, and really digging into division three athletics uh, as a university. Uh, Northeastern had just uh, sort of transitioned to be one of the primary uh, uh, sports on, on campus and MIT was focused on success at the collegiate level in Roy. So my perspective is, is a, sort of a real life experience summary. Um, I've also had the honor of uh, coaching US uh, rowing in the development camp and uh, lightweight rowing and then being a coach on the US senior team in 2000 and 2008. Um, and to be clear, you know, the coaches I recruited at the Boston College Crew Club were quite different than the athletes that I, I recruited at Tufts, who were actually quite different than the types of recruits that I had at Northeastern. But the bottom line with all these young people was that their search was to find a place where they could row with uh, sort of competitive abandon while pursuing a degree at an amazing university. 
Um, so um, with the fact that no two institutions are really the same, the process for young people and their families is certainly uh, sort of a, uh, almost a thrill ride in some ways. It's very, very exciting to be recruited or work through the recruiting process, especially with college coaches. And it also can be a real challenge for sure. So I'm gonna do some talking. I'm gonna keep talking. I'm gonna show you a couple pictures of some crews. Uh, there may be some furious note-taking along the way. And I just wanna say, I'm, I'm happy to share these slides with you. Um, and certainly as part of uh, our community, there are certainly people on this call who are anticipating an answer. Just tell me about this thing so I can understand a facet of what I wanna know about recruiting. I'll do my best, but like I said, it's really gonna be sort of an overview. Um, and just so you know, down at the bottom here on this slide, you can see um, a link that is app.sli.do. And if you type into that link um, and the event code 69525, that's where Beatrice is going to be um, monitoring our, uh, our questions. And uh, anything you answer, anything you provide there, we can actually keep. So if, if we do things in the chat, as soon as the call ends, we, we lose the questions. So, excuse me. But, um, by doing it on Slido, we can, we can keep track of the questions. Um, the other thing that I think is really important about just sort of sharing this sort of goofy slide is that no one person has all the answers here. So CRI has a huge advantage in the, in the recruiting process. And it's not me and it's, it's not uh, you know, all the amazing boats we have, it's really each other. And uh, my hope today is to sort of share some information, but get you engaged with figuring out what's best for you and your family in terms of getting answers and finding some resources that can help you. And I think that begins, and, and I don't know if they're on the call tonight, but uh, I would just love to just give a quick shout out to our coaches who are just amazing and who really help define who our athletes are, not just what they are, just not just their numbers, but who they are as people. Um, I know that the Roe Boston coaches have promoted this to the kids in the Roe Boston program. I know that the Comp Youth coaches have promoted this to Comp Youth. We put in our e-news. So, I think they're just uh, the compilation of talent that we have at CRI to really work with, with our young people holistically. Um, I just haven't been seen many high school programs as a, high school, as, as a collegiate coach where kids are not handled, but they're well led and they're given the opportunities to thrive within the, the parameters of the programs. Um, you know, I was hearing from one parent the other day who just said that, you know, while her son never made it to the top boat at CRI, He's been a very successful rower at the Division III level and, and has had a fantastic experience. And that gave them perspective about what CRI was for him as a young person. And I think that's just one of the really neat stories that come out of, uh, come out of, uh, come out of CRI on a regular basis. The other thing that's important just to note as we get started here is that I'm not really gonna address COVID, but I think you'll see that this is not a, the COVID doesn't change a lot of what I'm talking about. So uh, there may be COVID specific questions happy to do what I can, but I'm obviously not coaching college right now during COVID, so I, I don't want to presume that I know the answers to those things. Today, we're going to cover really three big topics, exploring the process itself, university admissions and admission support, and the differences between club division one and division three rowing. And um, a super quick at the end of the presentation, I will do some discussion of financial aid, but again, um, that that uh, landscape is changing also pretty rapidly. And so I just want to give people an overview, but I'm not going to be able to answer uh, a ton of questions about that. Uh, so let's let's just get into the um, recruiting process. So I'm going to click around a little bit, but but I want to just use this slide in terms of uh, two two sort of pictures. On the men's side, this uh, both these slides are from 2018 grand final of the Division one national championships. And uh, uh, this is what the finish line, for those of you who haven't had the thrill of being on a finish line at, uh, at the Division I National Championships, um, it's, uh, it's really something. Um, but here we go. So I hope you can see that picture. Uh, that is the men's varsity eight final. And what you see here, kind of interesting, is that you know, like most rowing races, you really can't tell where the finish line is for those parents and some of the coaches who are on the call. The finish line sort of bisects the course this way. 
And so what you can see is this yellow boat here with the blue blades in front, that's Yale University. They're in front by about one length of the boat, one length of the rowing shell. Um, and uh, what you can see with this picture is that this crew behind them, the University of Washington, really doesn't have a chance to win the race at this point. You know, the, 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 the jig is up and it looks like Yale is going to win that particular race. So that's the men's final. On the women's side, much different racing, right? So here you have the University of California up here, um, courtesy of uh, Row 2K. Thank you, Row 2K. Uh, you have um, University of Washington right here in the blue, in the purple, and then you have University of Texas here charging through. Interesting about this picture is that the boats are overlapped, right? So again, the finish line kind of bisects the, um, the picture here. But what you can see is this white boat here, the front of this white boat and the back of this white boat are about tip to tail if you look at the angles. And in between is this boat where really the eight, seven, six, five, right between the five seat and the four seat is about halfway into that boat. So as they finish in this race, these crews are about half a boat length off of each other. And you're wondering why I'm telling you so many stories about this. I have a plan. So what does that mean to a college coach? So looking at the men's side, what you see is that the Yale crew and the Washington crew were basically about three seconds apart. California, not in the picture, was about a four second difference back. On the women's side, exciting race. California took it at basically six minutes, 15. Washington, a second and a half later, it's six, 16 and a half seconds. And then another second and a half later about there was Texas. So again, about a three second difference between the winning team and the and the third place team, the bronze medal team, and about a half minute, second and a half between those crews. So why is that important to a college coach? Well, in the IRA final, if we look at it a different way, the winning time was 601 or 361 total racing seconds, 60 seconds in a minute, times six minutes, 360, Easy for me because it's adding one second, 361 seconds. So if one boat race, one boat length is about three seconds, 601 to 604, finishing one boat length, like imagine that seeing that picture of a full boat length distance between the two crews, we're only talking about a 1% difference in boat speed on that day. The variances and the tolerances of recruiting athletes who can make a difference in division one rowing is phenomenal. And the, and the thresholds that the athletes work at are at those types of thresholds. When it comes to college recruiting, college recruiting is about getting faster. I mean, the athleticism of those women to finish that race and surveying the line, is the, it, there's just nothing like it to see a boat race finish that closely. And um, a lot goes into winning rowing races, but it begins obviously with the athletes in the boat. So when we start talking about the recruiting process, one of the rules that coaches follow is that generally, you know, there's an 80, 20 rule in most sports. You know, you go to Las Vegas, whatever, faster, stronger, better athletes generally win about 80% of the time. That's why we have movies about underdogs. It's a one in five chance. We know from uh, you know, uh, all, all kinds of things that the probability of, of winning is, is really a, an interesting study into itself. And coaches are looking for safe bets. So when we're talking about a coach's general priorities around recruiting, there are two, I think really, there were sort of thematically sort of two things that coaches are looking for to recruit the fastest athletes with what you know about them now, let's say on November 19th, and what we're going to learn about them in order for them to thrive in my program for four years. One of the things that I talk to recruits sometimes about was imagine yourself four years ago as a, as a seventh or an eighth grader. What do you think is gonna change between seventh and eighth grade and your senior or junior year of being recruited 
And who are you going to be in another four years? Holy moly. The transformation is going to be amazing. And the investment in the recruiting process is to try to make a pretty good guess, an educated guess about how you're going to continue on your athletic and academic trajectory. And then I think the second really high priority is to recruit athletes with potential who can possibly make a, a, a difference at an indeterminate time, some point in the future, who could potentially change the entire trajectory of your program. When we think about you know, when to start the recruiting process with a coach, it's really when you have something to share. Um, you can do it as early as your sophomore year now, but understand that physiology in rowing is different than it is in maybe basketball or field hockey or some of these other sports where, where talent is expressed early in someone's career and then they, they refine it. In rowing, physiologically, an eighth grader racing a junior in high school is <laughs> crazy at some level, unless you have exceptional athletes. Um, but coaches have to make those projections as too. And so really what they're looking for is really to talk to the, to generally to the older, more ma sort of matured or stronger athletes, because it's a safer bet and they're closer to being able to produce results that make the case for the athlete. I think one of the things that sometimes people think is that coaches are trying to discriminate against athletes when they're going through the recruiting process. And I think one of the things that, that is often under, un, mis, un, um, sort of understated is that coaches really wanna find great people to be on their teams. And so even approaching the conversation with a coach about what's not so much a selling point, but what's actually genuinely exciting to you about what you're doing with rowing and what you, excites you about your performance really matters. And we'll see in a couple minutes, you know, there, there really are a lot of, the, there are a lot of individual stories about how recruiting works with college coaches. Second thing, I just want to stay on here for a second. Oops. How do I go back there? Oh boy, now I'm getting lost. Um, second thing I want to say is that um, advocacy and self-advocacy by, by the athletes themselves, massively important. It's much easier for a college coach to understand the potential of an athlete if they have a direct relationship with that athlete exclusively, not with the parents, not with the family, not with the dog, just making sure that when there's an appropriate time for an athlete to share something authentically exciting about their athletic performance, could be their junior year, could be their sophomore year, could be the spring of their senior year, doesn't matter that that comes directly from the athlete themselves. Looking for safe bets begins with understanding who they're talking to and who you're talking to. I think that's a, that's a very, very different perspective than trying to, you know, I'll say it now and I'll say it again, you know, you're not buying a car, right? You're not trying to sell yourself. They're not buying a number, they're, they're, they're investing in a person. Okay, so every picture tells a story. Um, this is a crew that I coached at Northeastern. Uh, uh, just to give you a sense, we just did that whole 1% deal, right? Well, in the fall of the, of the, of the, of the freshman of, of year of this freshman crew, uh, they, they fell behind Harvard by about 25 seconds. That's a whole lot of 1%, right? Uh, in the spring, we finished about four seconds behind them in our dual race. At the Eastern Sprints, we finished behind them by two seconds. And at the Division I National Championships, we beat them uh, to be the fastest crew from the East in the country uh, and win a bronze medal at the Division I National Championships. Uh, this was the first non-Ivy League crew in 10 years to medal at the National Championships in the Freshman 8 event. Uh, super cool to hear that story and like, oh, that's neat. But one of the things about images is, is sort of, what is this image about? Well, for those that I haven't met, um, I'm 6'3 and I weigh 195 pounds. And if you follow my cursor across the line of these heads, one of the things you see is that these guys were, were, were monsters. They were really tall. Um, and uh, that has both its advantages and its disadvantages when it comes to uh, uh, rowing. The following year, the stroke of the Northeastern Varsity Eight, uh, I'm not gonna name his name, but uh, 
on his best day and when the sports media guys were around, he's 5'11". The guy sitting behind him in the seventh seat was 6'10". So to think that size is a, is a situation that matters in rowing, again, there's a story to every recruit. This year, obviously, our focus was to recruit tall athletes. The other thing, and, I, and I, I've, I've taken a lot of pictures out of my presentation, but uh, this one also is important to me to tell you the allegory of recruiting is that there are a lot of Americans in this crew. There, there are uh, seven, six Americans in this crew, none of whom were on the junior national team, not one. One guy tried it and, and didn't even make it out of the regional to uh, try for, for the, uh, 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 the, the, the JNT camp the summer of his junior year. No rowing pedigree from these guys. They were from outside of Detroit. They were from the Jersey Shore. Um, and the other thing about them was that their average time over 2K by the spring of their freshman year was 6.08. So they're a pretty strong bunch of guys. One of the things about this picture in relation to recruiting is, that's also important is who's not in the picture. There was a highly recruited junior national teamer from Europe that we brought that I recruited to be on this team, on this boat. And it didn't work out um, for a number of reasons. Again, I'm, I'm not gonna bore you with the details, but to say that the story behind this crew is that in March, they lost one of their fastest guys. These, these athletes lost one of their top recruits in this eight. And we replaced the guy who went back home with someone who hadn't broken 6.30. And when he came to Northeastern, I saw him row at Crash Bees and I don't think he broke the top 100 kids in the country in Crash Bees. Crash Bees is the, the World Rowing Championships in Boston. The boat got faster as soon as there was clarity around who was in the boat and why they were there. And the story of the young guy who, who couldn't, you know, I think, I think by the time he, I think on our last test, he, he pulled a 624, but that's way, way off what the boat average was. And it fits, you know, so this picture fits many of the stereotypes that I think people have both about the recruiting process. Oh my gosh, yeah, he's gonna tell us a story about all these tall guys and they're all so pedigreed and, you know, junior national team and, and they've been rowing for 17 years and, you know, my kid is never gonna row division one. And then you start digging into, you start peeling back some of the layers of the onion and you realize that each of these athletes actually came to rowing in a very, very different way. And that even at the division one level, this is not about um, uh, people who have dedicated themselves solely to uh, the sport to, to succeed. Final thing, every one of these guys graduated, mechanical engineers, business majors, some of these guys graduated with honors. They were the right fit for the university and they thrived in the environment in which they trained at a particularly high level and they studied at a high level and we'll get a little bit more into that. So what, when I, when I was talking about sort of the fit and how to thrive at, at, at university, you know, the college recruiting process really does use past results to predict future success, not only as an athlete and not only as a student, but someone who embodies the core values of the program. And I think the, the first step in the recruiting process to understand where your values and where what's important to you fits into the programs that you're exploring, you're just sort of looking around, is what I sort of call the, the body of work. And the body of work is really, you know, athletic capacity to begin. You know, there's a, there's a, there are athletic standards in rowing, whether it's club rowing or division one rowing. Um, uh, you know, 2Ks, 5Ks, 6Ks, 10Ks. Uh, I had a young, young person that I was recruiting once and um, didn't have an erg. His coach didn't believe in 2Ks. He'd never taken a 2K. And so I just, you know, the beauty of the erg is you can just send in results of different pieces. So he sent me a, uh, uh, some practice results. And some of those practice results matched against some of the practice results of, of, of guys on our team. You know, uh, there are some pretty standard workouts. And so it, there, there isn't a success or a failure by a particular score, but what athletic capacity does is it puts you in the range of the conversation where you are going to thrive athletically in the programs that you're talking to. 
and you reflect what the program is looking for athletically, right? So um, I'll say it. I'll say it now, and I'll just say it again later. But part of thinking about athletic capacity, and we're talking about potential, is it, if you if you think about going to a program where you're the slowest kid starting your freshman year, you go back to that eighth grade analogy and the juniors in high school. Part of the investment in your athletic trajectory needs to have, you need to be aware of where you are in the program. Are you one of the fastest people on the team? So are you not going to be pushed by athletes in the program? You know, if you're, if you're a CRI rower and you're looking at a club program, you know, they're not going to have boats that are as nice. I mean, CRI had three full-time boatmen before, or two full-time boatmen before we uh, uh, shut down for COVID, you know, do they even have somebody who can fix boats? Uh, your capacity to understand what it means to be in fast boats. Are you going to go faster in high school than you did in college? It's a sad story that some people talk about. Or are you the slowest kid that you're talking to from a program that you really want to go to, but you're not fast enough? That's a different conversation, but understanding your place in the context of the athletic trajectory of the next four years, super, super important. A coach might not be interested in an athlete who's going to arrive as one of the fastest kids on the team right now, unless there are six or seven other kids like that who are going to be able to make that program shift and change. Standardized testing. Um, many colleges have gone test optional at admissions this year. You know, some because they view tests as unnecessary, some because of the difficulties in test taking during, you know, obviously during COVID-19, and others because the real life disparity really between those who avail themselves of test prep programs and the availability to actually figure out how to game the test and those who don't or simply can't. Um, and uh, I think we'll see a, a majority of colleges that will likely not require SAT or ACT testing uh, for admissions, uh, but you should know. And I think the coaches can be a good resource for you to say, hey, should I take this or not? And how important is it? Are you gonna weigh it? You know, as a recruit, you, you, you may not have a lot of time to do all the box checking that you think you quote unquote should do for recruiting. If you didn't have to study for an ACT or an SAT test, whether it's in a class or in a book for two hours or three hours or five hours a week for the next five weeks, but you could do one other thing to improve your chances of getting into a college, what would that be? And I think that's an opportunity for, for us to talk about making sure that, that you're, you know, and, and we'll get to it with what number is the most important to a coach, but thinking about what, what space you occupy in, this, in, in the recruiting process with a coach, you can start to think about how you want to focus your time and energy with, your, with, your, with the recruiters that you're talking to. Obviously, coaches also want to know about AP testing and class taking, um, what classes you took, grades, subjects, challenges. All of that stuff tells a story. So which number is the most important to a college coach? Really sort of all of them. Um, but at the same time, ones that, again, help that coach understand the story of who you are. And I think this is where it gets a little more uh, uh, nuanced. In college, rowing is not necessarily more important than academics, but it may not be less important. And, um, and, and what I mean by that is when I was coaching at Boston College, multiple New England championship winners, team championships, the whole business, the, the amount of work that the athletes did at that club program, I would say was fairly equivalent to the work that the athletes at Tufts did and the athletes at MIT did and the, and the time that Northeastern athletes spent. It's focused in different ways. It may not be as efficient, but rowing is gonna be an enormous part of your life in college. And I think the thing that we wanna put in perspective is I've, I've had recruits say, rowing is the most important thing. That is a huge red flag for me. You know, show me the first millionaire that made their, you know, somebody who made their first million in rowing, like, come on, there are more important things to life than just college sports. And that's coming from the coaching perspective, because what the coaches are looking for is an academic match. And that's what I'm talking about with the DNA. Um, you know, when I was recruiting at, at, at MIT, I was looking for sort of like genius math nerds who are capable of maintaining nationally mandated body weight standards while competing at the highest levels of our sport. 
that's a pretty specific academic and physiological profile. So I wasn't really talking to many, you know, medieval literature majors, right? Um, I spoke with a lot of recruits who had triple eight hundreds on their SATs, a lot who had straight A's, uh, you know, semi facetious, like sent a rocket into orbit between diapers and sippy cups, you know, like these people were just unbelievable minds. Um, but the stories of the athletes who were admitted to MIT, again, a stereotypical, difficult place to get into and then be a successful athlete in. One of the recruits who, who was admitted was a young person who helped uh, his town paint uh, street numbers on curbs to uh, assist first responders on 911 calls. That was what their essay was about. I oftentimes encouraged rowers not to write about rowing because they're already going to get support from the admissions office from me about their rowing background and, and what I see as their value to rowing. And that's not to discourage people from suggesting that they should not talk about a passion. And I think with most rowers, it is a passion. But the idea is that it's authentic, right? Um, I had a, a, a female coxswain at MIT also, just sort of riffing on that a little bit, um, who had a summer internship and um, she couldn't get credit for it. I was like, wow, that's crazy. Why didn't you get credit for your summer internship? And she said, because it's with the defense department and what I did was classified and they wouldn't even acknowledge that I worked there. That's a story, right? That gets people's attention. She was an amazing coxswain. She coxed for four years. She made a difference in my program. I was able to write about her contribution to the program. She was able to tell me more about who she was. Key point here, averages are not individuals, right? Again, look at that tall wall of shoulders that I was coaching. You know, I could have stopped if the team had a 608 ERD average. That would have discouraged a lot of people from thinking that they should ever row at the division one level for men. On the other side, there are stories behind that, right? There's the story of the 638 guy who broke 630 and then broke 625 and then finally helped the team at 624. And I think relationships also quickly move beyond statistics. Once thresholds are met, we're really talking about reliability, honesty, integrity, and good answers to hard questions for both parties. Just remember, everybody checks social media. It's not about posting something offensive. One of the things that social media does is allow coaches to see who you are when the curtains are drawn, so to speak. And not so much, again, saying something that might turn people off, but just get a better understanding of who you are. And I'm not saying turn off your social media, but just be aware of what's going on. Again, another elephant in the room here is, is, is uh, you know, the assumption that coaches are somehow mystical people who have all the power. I think there is really a relationship here that I want to bring out to you. And one is that the coach, what the coach wants to know when they speak to you on the phone, are you going to come to my school? If I'm taking the time to speak with you, I want to know if you're going to come if you get admitted. What does the athlete want to know? Well, am I going to get in? Are you going to support me? How are we going to work this out? That is not a negotiation. It's actually an exchange of ideas. Where college coaches look for recruits, uh, they certainly look for them in questionnaires. There are all kinds of uh, online recruiting sites that we can suggest for you. Um, the other place they check is their voicemail and their inbox. Uh, that's probably the first place they check just about every day. Uh, don't be afraid to email a coach, any coach, anytime, ever. Again, just make sure that you're telling a story and that you're saying something meaningful about yourself or asking a question. Um, and I would also suggest just to take a little time on questionnaires. Those really are um, uh, one of the primary drivers of information for coaches because that puts you into a database that they can search and sort and, and sweat over. Um, and questionnaires are generally also updatable. So as you have information, it's not a bad thing to update your questionnaire. When to share, when to overshare, how much should you share? I think the thing that you wanna do is to think about showing college coaches your best, something that's great about you, something that thrills you. It doesn't, you don't have to assume that coaches just wanna know your, your, your stats, right? Um, and I think that that's, again, a way to modulate how you communicate with college coaches. I suppose there are some people I spoke with uh, multiple, multiple times through the recruiting process. 
There are other people. Uh, one of the guys in that boat, for instance, started rowing March of his senior year in high school. And he became a scholarship athlete and ended up making the national team for the, Uni the UK. So we'll get into sort of the timing of when to apply and all that stuff. But again, going back to that picture, it's really rich in some of these assumptions that people make. We just want to know when you have a meaningful update for a coach, share it with them. Important thing, um, college coaches don't recruit boats. So a lot of times athletes will say, I was, in a, I was in an eight that did a thing. That's cool, but I don't really care about how your eight did because I don't know if you're actually making the eight go fast or you're just some, somebody who sets the boat up well. Um, so what can you do? Send me good video. Good video, especially from CRI, is perpendicular to the boat. It's not your parents taking video from the finish line at the Lowell invite that's 45 minutes away and people are screaming and cowbells are going off and they're shaking because they're so excited they're trying to watch the race and take video of you so you can send it off to your favorite college coach. We have coaches, we have resources, we have flat water, we have people sitting in launches. It doesn't take much, 45 seconds. Mute on, mute off, doesn't matter. Just let us see you and let's see you pulling hard and let me see you doing something where there's a story behind what you're sharing with me. Hey coach, we did these, uh, you know, we're doing these two mile pieces and uh, you know, we're doing bridge to bridge pieces. We were doing racing starts. These are some of the best rowing strokes I've ever taken in my life. And this is why this, this video shows you who I am. Good news for coxswains. You don't need to tape the entire head of the Charles and send it to a college coach because I assure you, they're not gonna listen to 17, 16 minutes of coxing. What, what they wanna hear from coxswains really is not just a power 10, but what is it that you, what is the context of the audio that you're sharing with the college coach so that they can understand why you're communicating in the way that you're communicating? Obviously it's gonna be loud, but if you were to send some context, you know, our three, the three seat in our boat paint dries faster than this person puts their blade in the water. Before the race, I talked to the three seat and said, when I make this call, I want you to get your blade in faster. And then tell me the story. You know, we were lined up against Greenwich. We were two seats down. I needed to call a 10, but before we did that, I, I made this call. You're, what you're gonna hear me is talk to Allison about her, her blade work. We talked about it before the race. Boom, we picked up three seats. What that tells is not only sort of your ability to, to, to speak in the crew, but also it helps the coach understand the context of the relationship with the people in your boat. It's very, very helpful. How much to focus on weaknesses? Nobody has 100% of their strengths. Nobody. We're all flawed people. We all have stories. We all have things that influence our life. Improvements. When we go back to either the idea of, of recruiting to potential or recruiting to what I know now about you, knowing that you're on an upward trajectory, super, super helpful. Grades also tell a ton about commitment, thoroughness, work ethic, off the water and on. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, I sort of uh, uh, believe is that, you know, uh, high school athletes are pretty simple organisms. You know, um, they eat a lot. Uh, they grow, they row, they study, they're very energetic. And generally there's a, there's a parallel between how they're doing in school and how they're doing on the water. For whatever reason, oftentimes at the college level, that's the same thing. If, if, a, if a young person isn't doing well in school, that's reflected in what they bring to the boathouse every day. And likewise, if someone's injured, oftentimes we get concerned about their academic performance because their whole system of of routine and how they approach their life has changed. The worst day for an athlete, we used to say, is sort of the worst day for an athlete is a rest day, right? Because they don't get to do the thing they love. So, so what are the things that show consistency between being a good student and being a good athlete? That's why they call them student athletes. A few quick words about reach schools. Um, you know, I think that, that, that you should absolutely stretch and you should reach. But going back to some of the things we referred to in terms of the context of knowing that you're, or you're, you're talking to someone about a reach, uh, really, really important to put that in context of the other schools that you might be looking at 
and, and understand why you want to reach for a particular school. Is it because you think that that's a validation of your rowing career? I can't tell you the number of people who were thrilled to hear that the Northeastern coach or the MIT coach or the Tufts coach was recruiting them. And my first response was usually like, hey man, you called me. You know, like, I, I don't know, like, I guess I'm recruiting you, but really what we're doing is having a conversation about getting into, your, into the school. Be careful about trying to think that, that, that you have to go to a particular school to validate your high school rowing experience. You can go anywhere. You, the, the capacity of the people on this call is amazing. And I think finding a fit that gives you a thrill in the classroom and a thrill on the water is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a multivariable calculus that can't be standardized. And, and thinking that people have to tell you that in order to validate your high school experience, you have to go to a D1 school or you have to go to you know, this type of school. I think we should really be careful when you start hearing or feeling that way. Um, how much do improvements increase a chance for admission? They improve your chances a ton, right? Um, they, they, they're, 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 you know, when, when we talk about college coaches, I wouldn't say they're risk averse, but when we're talking about seeing someone with momentum on the rise, really what we're talking about is, 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 is feeling a sense of momentum and excitement about coming into our program and making, again, college recruiting is about making boats faster. So if you come in with energy and esprit and the capacity to handle uh, you know, your first year and your second year of coursework, and you can make our boats faster and you have the time to train and you're getting enough rest and you feel at home at the university that you're at, massive, right? Quick thing, one last thing, super quick. When looking at familiar, uh, when looking at co uh, uh, programs, you know, get familiar with the with with the teams themselves. Um, you know, take take a look at the team's uh, social media. Um, check the posts uh, uh, if if the team posts majors of its athletes. You know, a, a lot of people are very concerned about academics and athletics. You know, some universities um, uh, uh, post the uh, majors of their athletes, not just where they're from and their hometowns and their rowing pedigree. That's an interesting sort of message to people why they're posting majors. I think they want to show that uh, people aren't studying, you know, underwater fire prevention and, and, and just doing nothing but rowing. Um, and I think there's a reason why some schools don't. Um, one of the things that I think is really good that, that, that not enough recruits do, I'm talking about the student athletes here, is look at the performance of the teams nationally. Oh, I heard you did well, you know, against this one crew, but understanding a little bit more about the trajectory of the program and the regional and national performance really, really helpful. Um, yeah, I would check the team's website, you know, the, the news, like how do, they, how, do they, how do they communicate about their athletes? Do they just talk about pedigree? Some universities only talk about the successes of their athletes. They don't share much more. Others tell the story of the athlete. It's just an interesting set of values that those universities and those teams have. And to be clear, the coaches get to pick what they post, right? So that's a reflection of the coaching staff and the athletic department as much as it is the university. So moving quickly, I know, but I'm, uh, I'm amazed at how quickly this presentation is going here, but uh, I'm just gonna keep, keep rolling. Um, okay, so now we're getting into some of the differences in D1, D3, and where do I go? And, and again, like none of this is validation for who you are as a rower. I just wanna be very clear about that. But there are distinct differences, right? Uh, the playing and practice season of club rowing, um, uh, or just, just backing up one, one, one super quick. You know, we talked about academics um, not being more important, but not less. And again, I, I said it before, I'll say it again. That exists at all these levels, D1, D2, D3, and club rowing. People spend a lot of time thinking about crew. They can't help it. What's bliss to some recruits sounds terrible to others. For some, their best opportunities at college are simply rowing and studying. You know, like you hear the stories on the Olympics of like, oh my God, you know, you, you sacrificed so much and all you, all you did was do this sport and you did high school and boy, you know, what did you give up to do that? And most of the athletes that you, you hear in these interviews, so they didn't give up much. They were doing exactly what they wanted. They found their bliss. They loved the opportunity to train, to, to, um, to spend their, folk, their time in that, in that way. Other people want to study abroad maybe take a major that doesn't conform with the playing and practice season. You know, architecture is a good example of a major that 
doesn't conform well with rowing just because a lot of architecture labs start at eight or clock and eight or nine o'clock at night and go until one in the morning. Well, if you have a six o'clock wake up or five thirty wake up for practice and you're going to be rowing at pretty much any of the levels of collegiate varsity rowing, that's going to be an unsustainable balance. So the difference between playing and practice season is really around, uh, uh, for the purposes of this discussion, just the overview, is really coach supervision. Uh, uh, club coach, club rowing, there isn't much supervision. Athletes do a lot of the work. There's a lot of leadership within the, 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 the student athlete. You know, when I was the director of rowing, I was the director of rowing at Boston College for six years. I spent a lot of time with the club presidents. Uh, the club presidents ran fundraising. They ran, um, uh, they helped order equipment. I mean, they were the liaison. The, the, the club president was really the one who I had to go to to purchase uh, equipment because it's a student run club. I, you know, my boss was a junior econ major one year, right? Like that's sort of what club rowing is all about. Um, at the D3 level, there are stricter times when a coach can be with you or not. But again, there's some reliance on team culture where the coaching staff can and can't influence the, the direction of the program. And there's still opportunities for a lot of leadership within that program. And also uh, uh, often that people will not necessarily row all four years or they may take a semester off. Um, uh, at the D1 level, that's not really an opportunity. You know, when you're, when you're signing up to row for, for a division one program, you're really aligning yourself with the pursuit of academic excellence and the pursuit of, of pursuing your athletic performance to the highest level you can. Um, and it's got pressures at all, at, all, at all those levels. So really, you know, what is your life balance objective as much as sort of trying to please a, a, a rowing coach uh, when you're going into the recruiting process? More to say there, but I'm just gonna keep, keep rolling here. Admissions, holy moly. How much can a coach get you into a university or a college really depends. And when I say get in, one of the things about rowing and, and, and you know, I could show you a million pictures and tell you a million stories. We know that most rowing athletes are, are good students and want to succeed academically. So coaches support varies depending on the sort of the division that you're talking about. And, and how you can actually uh, leverage that support in support of your application and your academic performance, your extracurriculars, and the things that you wanna achieve when you go to a particular school. But what coaches can do, they can certainly provide and support academic or admissions pre-reads. Uh, universally, what that means is that, uh, gen and we're talking about varsity sports here, and again, it depends on a lot of things, but. Pre-reads can be conducted with the relationship between the athletic coach and admissions where admissions will give some form of direction or indication that you either will be continued into the admissions process or this is probably not a time for you to continue calling this athlete. It's not a pre-read for admission, it's a pre-read to continue the process. So coaches might say, hey, I'm gonna give you a pre-read. Cool, what they get is a double negative know that person is not not going to get in, right? Like we're pretty sure if they continue in the process, they're going to get in, but it's not a guarantee. Most schools also can do some form of coach reg recommendation or athletic flag. And what that means is that not only will you could, so, so there's a pre-read and then there's also a potential for a second read or a different type of read from the athletic perspective. Everybody applies to the admissions department. No one applies to the athletic department for admission in rowing. So you're not applying to, you know, X college and that coach is gonna decide anything. Everything goes to admissions. In this context, what that means is a coach could support your, your application by giving it a second consideration, a guaranteed second consideration, either as an athlete or in a pool of athletes. Some schools, for instance, the coach might send, uh, they really need a new field hockey goalie. They need two forwards and a defense, uh, someone on defense. The baseball uh, coach sends a pitcher and uh, three outfielders, the softball coach, X, Y, and Z. The rowing coach sends four 
you know, 10 names of which they know they're going to get four athletes in, in rowing. These 10 athletes are the, are the vetted 10 athletes. I would love to have any of these students in my, in my program. What that, what that is, is an athletic read, right? So they, the, the university admissions office does their thing, but supports athletes slightly different than they would others. They do the same thing for engineers. They do the same thing for uh, musicians. They do the same thing for uh, people in theater. It sounds cool, but it's part of what admissions does to be able to balance the student body, right? Um, so the, that's just part of the admissions process. And then there's also early decision support and regular decision support. Um, again, can't get into too much of the detail here, but there's ED1, ED2, regular decision, early, you know, all that stuff. Um, one of the things in athletic recruiting that admissions can also support the coaches with is indications, official indications of, of, of admission that enable the coach and the athletic department to provide you with information. That really comes in, I missed a bullet here, but it really comes in three, three, three bullets. The first is in the Ivy League, we put a lot in, you know, there's a lot of Ivy League talk and there's a lot of people here at CRI who are interested in Ivy Leagues around likely letters. Likely letters are simply letters from a coach who's been authorized to share with you, not so much that you've got the pre-read and that you're, you know, you're, you're not being denied admission, but the likely letter actually moves the process more forward officially. Um, and those are binding letters and there's a lot to that. And again, I, I don't wanna get into the details because we, we do have to be careful of time here, but the coaches that, that may want to provide you a likely letter from the Ivy League will walk you through that process. For women's division one rowing, there's also um, the national letter of intent, the NLI. Uh, that is done all on one day. Uh, it's a little bit more traditional in terms of the way that people perceive recruiting. You know, you might get a couple different NLIs and you only can sign one. Um, and again, allowing yourself to, to, to sort of, and we'll get into this a little bit, but really thinking about um, what it means to sign an LI, NLI. And, and that usually also comes with some form of an official declaration of athletic support, meaning uh, financial aid and, and a scholarship. I already mentioned it, you know, coaches don't get you in, admissions does. Um, and I've also s sort of preambled with, you know, recruiting and, and, you know, there's a lot of talk like, Ooh, where are you talking? Who's talking to you? What coaches are talking to you? I just, again, caution the idea that there's validation of who you are as an athlete and a person by what college coaches are talking to you. I, I, I had, I had anywhere from 300 to 400 emails that I would email through the course of a particular year recruiting a class of 10 athletes, right? That's just, that's just what it is, right? And so when we're talking about being in touch with a coach, that pool of athletes shrinks considerably as authentic and genuine information is exchanged. The athlete giving me good information, me getting more excited about this person because again of the full package, not just their 2K, not just their SAT scores, not just the fact that they're gonna increase my academic standards, but it's really, you know, this is a four-year commitment, especially at the division one level. I'm going to spend a ton of time with this person. I'm a huge fan of believing in the integrity of the process and of the people that are on my team. And I want to know that you're the right person. So as that process sort of synthesizes into pools, it becomes more authentic than, uh, you know, um, playing cards, you know, and, and who's, got, who's got the New York Yankees and who has the Boston Red Sox card. Got to be really um, aware that that you're making a big commitment. Uh, again, much bigger subject than what we have time for tonight. Uh, but I will say that generally coaches have greater leverage during the early decision process where they have a demonstrated relationship with the athlete. Uh, certainly it helps the coaches again, sort of generally risk averse if they can get their whole class signed in, in, in September. Some will do that, most don't. But, it, but certainly early decision or early, early decision making helps balance the class in a way that the coach understands if it's a, if it's a scholarship opportunity, they understand how to, how, to, how to maximize their scholarship awards. And if it's just simply how to balance their class and how to support the athletes that are in their pool, say the division three level, 
it's really helpful to be in that early process. The chances for admission also generally go up, obviously, by applying early. Uh, and so again, you know, you might have a pool of ED1 or ED2. So, you know, you, that's the stuff that you have to figure out. I obviously wanted to put on the slide and, and bold it and underline it and shout it from the rooftops. None of that is required to get into college. And none of that is required even to be recruited. Again, going back to that picture, those, those, those athletes that I was standing with, not every one of those athletes was admitted you know, it, it, or early. Some of them were recruited even quite late. And the process for you is, is organic and needs to happen at the speed that you're comfortable with. When I'm talking about the proverbial you, I'm talking about the student athlete. I'm talking about the athlete. When they're ready to, to advocate for themselves is the best time to begin the, the college recruiting process. Um, I've, I've said it before, I'll say it again. You know, if you're young, the coaches might not just know what to say. I'm sort of skipping down here a little bit, but you know, it's never too late to find a great fit, but it's also, you know, geez, the, the rules have changed and you really can talk to coaches very early in your career, but with rowing, it's a little different because the physiology, just be aware of that. You know, you, the, the, if you're not hearing from a coach, you're not talking to a coach, it's not because they're not interested. It's just that you're a year and a half away from, you know, from, from middle school to sophomore year's big difference from sophomore year to junior year can tend to be a big difference. People mature and grow in different ways. Let the process evolve based on how it works for you authentically. Um, and a word, you know, to future Olympians, you know, I've, I've had uh, people join Olympic teams and make Olympic teams from, from club rowing, from D3, from D1. There's no pathway to the Olympic team either. And I think the thing that you want to be respectful of, if, if, if you can at all costs, it's, it's to not to assume that you're going to make the program that I've dedicated my professional life to faster just because you think you've got no time or you come from a program that you think you know will will improve. Authentic connection is really, really the name of the game. And again, I, uh, uh, one last thing I wanna say about that is it's not always reciprocated by coaches. And I think that doesn't matter. I think the, the, the thing, there, there are different types of people around the world in a lot of different positions. And I think part of the learning experience here is to really find how you align with particular people if they don't get back to you, do you overthink it? Do you not overthink it? Are they busy or are they ignoring you? All of those machinations are part of what uh, is uh, digested and, and processed in this process. Um, and I, I can't speak more than to say, you know, mutual respect really makes uh, the recruiting process much, much more successful. Um, and again, everything you do sort of tells a story. You know, if you're speaking to Tufts, small, private, highly regarded university in a city, it tells a different story than if you're also applying to Michigan, huge state school out in the Midwest, uh, strong tradition of non-rowing, you know, the women's team, amazing, men's team is a club. Um, depending on your gender, you know, or which way you identify, like all of that stuff can matter in terms of how you're actually looking at schools. And when you tell coaches, I'm looking at Tufts, Michigan, and Cornell. Those coaches know what you're saying when you say those things, right? So it's not bad to say that you're looking at a D3 school and a D1 school. I've had athletes tell me that. But I think the idea is that there needs to be a thread that binds it other than, well, these are the coaches that called me. Holy moly, you know, go back to that 350 email thing. Like, yeah, you heard from me, but that doesn't mean I'm recruiting you. I'm just letting you know that if you have something to share with me, Go ahead and shoot me an email and fill out the questionnaire and we'll talk. So, so, so just understand again the context of the audience a little bit. Know a little bit about the school. Uh, another word to wise, like, you know, on, a, on, on visits, I'm not going to cover it here, but you can go visit those universities and their official and unofficial visits. Uh, big, big no no is to open the uh, statement with, so tell me about your program, right? Like, holy moly, that's a, that's a hard way to start an authentic relationship. So, just let yourself shine. Wrapping up, financial aid. Um, the types of schools influence the types of aid that's available to families. And really in rowing, there are state universities, private universities or colleges, and Ivy Leagues. And each of them has sort of discrete processes that they follow, which can sometimes make the, the uh, sort of the challenge of understanding how to manage financial aid difficult if you don't understand that Cornell is an Ivy League school 
is different than Michigan, which is a huge state school, which is very different than Tufts University, which is a, which is a private school. And so understanding the types of schools that you're talking to can help immediately begin uh, sort of shape the way that you, you can manage the process. And I'm talking both to, to students here and to the parents. Sources of financial aid for athletes. Uh, just a quick summary. Uh, there are aids, there, there's aid and there are loans. Um, for nearly every applicant you need to, for, for Americans anyway, you need to fill out the FAFSA. Uh, that's a free application for federal student aid. Um, and the CSS profile, which is the color, college scholarship, um, college scholarship service profile. The CSS profile is primarily for private universities. Um, and the FAFSA is pretty much for everybody when it comes to qualifying for financial aid. And again, financial aid comes in the form of direct awards and aid and also loans, right? There are college and university awards. And these, these are generally awards. These are not loans. So uh, there are awards that a college may give to students who have a certain GPA and are in a particular major. That is, that is a, a reduction in cost of, of, of tuition um, and the costs of the school. One thing that, it, that, that it's just a, just want to put it out there, there's also local aid. Um, and, and I think a lot of, there are a lot of granting organizations out there. There's Rotary Clubs, there are other organizations within communities that support athletes and that support uh, people going to particular schools. You might dig around a little bit. That, you know, these aren't huge awards, but a thousand bucks over four years ain't nothing. So, uh, you know, if you can, if your if your if your student athlete can sort of explore those opportunities, or they talk about it at school, don't throw that flyer out. Right? You never know. Athletic aid. Everybody wants to know about the scholarship. Here's the deal with the scholarship. The scholarship is an award in aid based solely on athletic performance. I don't care how hard you work. I don't care how you know um, how dedicated you are to the sport. You know what? You're about to enter my world, and everybody better be dedicated, as dedicated as you are. So what we're talking about here is a measurement of how much I can support you as an athlete at my particular university. My expectation is then, therefore, that you're going to actually deliver on that by being a good student and a good athlete. The final source is family support. Um, and I know that that's uh, also a lot, uh, you know, college is very challenging for a lot of people in this world. It's very, very expensive. And um, um, I think the thing that, that, that I wanna say here is that nearly all the students that I worked with built packages. And that's a combination, not only so everybody sort of has a piece uh, or a little bit of skin in the game, oops, sorry about that. Um, but also that's the reality. It takes that much to be able to afford the cost of, 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 of college. And so just to summarize it for parents and for people to sort of understand a lot of it, there's federal aid, there's university, there's athletic, there's parents, and there's loans. Um, with regard to athletic awards and aid, the one thing I just wanna share is that generally, by the time a coach gets to offering uh, some form of athletic aid, which is my wheelhouse, so I'm gonna stay in the athletic aid award arena, they're really trying to make their best offer first. And, and I know that, that you know, um, one sort of stereotype is like, you're not, you're not buying a car here, right? So um, if a coach makes an offer, it really is likely the best they're going to do. There may be changes in the process that make more funds available, but the, the pressure from the coaching side is that they've got a restricted pot of resources. And what they need to do is distribute those resources as effectively as possible. A lot of thought goes into it because of the limitations of how much coaches can award. It's, it's a tremendous opportunity. And also it's generally something where once you have a coach who may offer you some form of athletic aid, that coach may also work very hard with other resources to help navigate how it may be a fit to get into that university. 
Last thing I'll say there is that I think it's not important when I was speaking with athletes about athletic awards, I generally tended to try to have the parent and the student on the phone at the same time. So that is, you know, I said that the parents really should sort of avoid the, the, um, the, the, the siren song of trying to reach the college coaches. Don't do that. Um, but when it comes to something as serious as making a family decision around financial aid, holy moly, that is definitely a time to, uh, to have a family conversation and for everybody to hear what the coach is saying so that they can affirm or, or, or sort of make sure that, that everything's aligned. Wrapping up, um, I think the, um, the opportunity here is to, for, for parents to be patient, to help uh, uh, student athletes advocate for themselves. And I think for, for the athletes on this call, um, be bold, you know, be persistent um, and, and be yourself as you go through this. And um, as I said, you know, for parents, especially communication with a college coach without a child involved can really end the recruiting process quite quickly. So just be, be aware of that, that you really want your child to advance the process at the speed and the terms that they're ready to, to make this process happen. So that was it. Stay safe, be well, pull hard, go fast. There was a uh, one last thing. Um, uh, there was a talk about college consultants and how they play a role in the college recruiting and search process. And is it worth the money? I'm not gonna go into whether it's worth the money. I will say that I've uh, one of the things about college coaches, quite frankly, is I generally don't know which athletes worked with the college recruiting process or, or, or organization and who didn't, because that's part of the deal. You know, the advocacy for uh, uh, the athletes is really between that athlete and the recruiting service. Um, I also know, you know, by their sophomore or junior year, I find out that this person did or this person didn't. Um, and, you know, easy answer is to say it depends. I think the, the longer answer is it really is about how the family makes decisions and how much, how much help you think that your child may need to advocate for themselves. Um, college recruiting services do a tremendous value to people to be able to put their best foot forward. It's not formulaic generally, uh, but uh, I, I, think, I think families need to make that decision uh, based on the comfort level that the athlete, the student athlete might have in the recruiting process. What is the recruitable 2K time for division one versus division three? Recruitable 2K time, um, Geez, I'll, I'll, I would take anybody who pulled sub 610 as a male or, you know, uh, broke six, seven, you know, uh, uh, 750 as a, as, a, as a high school senior. Uh, and I think, I think from there it varies, right? So, so um, when you think about division one and division three, those times are coming closer together. I think a lot of athletes at CRI can sort of go in either direction. And it's really about the trajectory that they want to be on. Um, the coaches will be very upfront with you about what a recruitable time is. Um, you know, they generally try to look for the fastest athletes again to make their programs faster. So even within Division Three, the variance in speed is really sort of all over the place, um, and the and the thresholds for coaches are all over the place. I think in Division One, it's a little bit more uniform. The top five or six or seven universities are really looking for athletes who are, who are going um, uh, at speed sub 620, 615 on the men's side, certainly sub eight minutes on the women's side. Um, and from there, it really becomes about a fit. You know, uh, uh, an athlete going to California is very different than an athlete going to Harvard. <clears throat> California is warm. You guys have been outside today. Like there's a lot of differences in the ways that people look at universities beyond just the, uh, the, the 2K time. Um, I think the time for coaches to talk about recruiting goals with their athletes, I think, again, that's really a one-on-one -on -one between the coach and the athlete. I think if, if, if you want to, if you're having a conversation at home about the college recruiting process, I think the appropriate thing is for, um, uh, for the athletes to speak directly with the coaches who know them the best, who understand the college recruiting process, and can help guide our young people and advocate for them in a way that helps them approach colleges 
uh, 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 with confidence and with uh, with comfort. Um, I know it's uh, it's a little after eight. It's about eight ten. Um, I'd love to continue to to talk to people. I do want to give people the freedom to just knock off the phone. It's eight o'clock on a on a Thursday night, so no offense if you if you knock off. I'll stay on a little while longer and answer a couple more questions if people have them. Um, but before you all head off, I just want to thank you very much. Again, really want to thank our CRI coaches. I see a couple of them on the call. Uh, I just want to say. Um, Sierra would not be what it is without the who of who we are. And uh, that begins with uh, the amazing people who serve our, our, our young athletes. So uh, thank you, thank you very much. Um, and just to let you know, also this, is, this talk is being recorded and we'll make it available to people. Thank you, Beatrice, for letting me know that. So if you wanna bug out, you can. Um, if people have some questions, um, I'll feel free to, to, to stay on for just a couple more minutes. Um, when should a junior reach out to a college coach for the first time fall, winter, spring? Um, really, it's when that junior is ready to talk to the college coach, when they have a story, when they have something to say. I heard from kids um, throughout their entire junior year, um, uh, there isn't a formula to this. So really what, um, what helps the most is for the young person to fill out the questionnaire and then inform the coach that they're, uh, they'd like to talk to them if they can. Um, and, uh, and begin the process when they're ready to advocate for themselves. Um, I think that's, that's the way it's, it's generally worked. And again, just to reiterate, the process is relatively organic. So it happens at the pace and the speed of the athlete, especially starting in the junior year, as much as it does on the expectations of a coach. There's no judgment between someone who contacts me in you know, the, the fall of their junior year versus the, the spring of their junior year. It's really about sort of what the, um, what the, uh, what the trajectory of that athlete is. Uh, good question. Um, what is the questionnaire? Uh, every uh, varsity program and many club programs, <clears throat> excuse me, have a questionnaire that they put on their, uh, their team website uh, under, uh, under a recruiting tab. Uh, and it's just basic stats name, birthday, uh, address, uh, you know, a couple, a couple um, uh, data points, you know, 2K, 5K, 6K, other athletic successes, 250 words to tell me about yourself, send it in. Uh, it's one of the most effective ways to engage with college coaches is to, is to, is to complete that questionnaire. What should such a junior do given the challenges of COVID to share successes. I'll tell you a story. Um, I, had a, I had a young person who ended up coming to the university that I was coaching at, who um, coach didn't believe in two Ks and um, made them do a lot of running and made them do plyometrics because uh, they didn't have enough ergs for everybody on the team. And so I, I said, so uh, what do you do? And the student said, well, we do you know, pull-ups, push-ups, mountain climbers, we, we have a timed mile run, you know, we have to run out and run back in a certain time to make varsity. And then we get on the water and we usually sort it out on the water after we select the team that way. I was like, cool. Um, turns out we're actually doing timed runs and a plyometric circuit. And uh, so tell me your stats. Couple couple of days later, the, the young person sent me their, their, their one minute pull up test and their mile run. And that was enough to help me understand the physiology of that, that student because we happened to be doing a series of uh, plyometrics where athletes were doing pull-ups for a minute and, uh, and a timed run. And uh, it was sort of you know serendipity at some level, but I just asked a couple of the freshmen, like, how many pull-ups did you do? You know, it's not a big in for me, you know, whatever. And, uh, and then I shared with the student what the, what the guys on the team were doing in terms of pull-ups. So, uh, there's a lot of different types of opportunities to show uh, uh, physiology beyond either success on the water in a team boat or uh, simply erg times. Um, and I think that's where, again, I don't wanna speak too much about COVID, but those coaches might have some suggestions about what athletes could, uh, could submit or what, what, what kind of things they can do to advocate for themselves. Thank you very much for uh, jumping on. It, it's uh, it's 
it's super bizarre to do this without being able to see faces and names. And um, especially at CRI where I have such an opportunity to meet, you know, an enormously passionate and, and connected group of adults and students and athletes to, uh, to our mission and to this place. But uh, I just want to thank you all very much for sticking with us through this, this time and, um, and certainly look out for more resources and information that we're going to share with you around the college process. Uh, we'll try to get a round table together and, uh, and, uh, and, and keep the conversation moving forward. I hope you uh, enjoyed this and um, look forward to seeing you at the boathouse at some point uh, super soon. Have a great Thanksgiving, everybody. Thank you very much.